Good morning, everyone. I'm Emma Howard Boyd, and I am chair of the Environment Agency, one of the bodies that is going to be key to del the delivery of the 25-year Environment Plan. And it's my huge honour, um, the Secretary of State has already done part of this job, to introduce our next speaker, Professor Dieter Helm. So if you'd like to come to the stage, I'm then going to moderate questions. Um, but one of the things I'm really pleased that um, Dieter has shown is great tenacity around the 25-year Environment Plan. Plan, but also a real spirit of engagement with others across different departments and different delivery bodies. So, Thank Peter, you. over Thank to you. you. Thanks very much. Thanks, uh, Emma. The uh, Secretary of State said that the risk of being late was that the warm-up app might outshine, outshine the key event. Well, trying to follow the key event is uh, altogether uh, a challenging. Um, what I'd like to do, and uh, a few minutes available for me today, is to provide a bit of the economics behind um, uh, environmental protection and explain why the natural capital agenda is absolutely critical to the delivery of the 25-year plan. And I, I'll start by just giving a bit of background as to how we got to where we are, highlight the risks that go with that, and then I will uh, turn to uh, how we might take some of these things forward. So here we are. We are uh, seven years since the key white paper, The Natural Choice. And I should say five secretaries of state as well. Uh, and we have now a 25-year plan. It's worth going back to the 211 white paper because there are two principles set out in that white paper, uh, both of which come together in the 25-year plan. The first one, which is something that uh, the late David Pierce had been pursuing right back with Chris Patton in the 1990 white paper, is essentially a recognition that we're not going to make much progress environmentally if we treat the environment as an add-on a luxury to be looked after after we've looked after economic progress. We've had uh, a couple of hundred years of economic progress without taking the environment properly into account. And environmentalists, and some of you here, have been involved in documenting minutely in the great naturalist traditions of Britain the decline of each and every species that suffered the consequences of that great industrialization. And anyone who takes a glance across to China can see how utterly devastating for a country, let alone the planet it is, to pursue economic growth as if the environment doesn't matter. So it's absolutely core that we must talk about our economy in which the environment is at least an integral part, if not the integral part, into the frame. So that's the first principle. And then the second one goes beyond simply taking the environment into the economy into account, but providing a constraint. A constraint says no more rot, no further decline in our natural assets. We must now get into the business of making them better for the next generation than they currently are. Now, I'm very proud. Someone's step, stepping ahead of my slides before I get there. But um, I, I'm very proud of the fact that the 25-year plan was the idea of the Natural Capital Committee, which is the child of the 211 white paper. We um, uh, struggled with how this overall objective could be achieved. And we thought that a generation was 25 years. And we subsequently thought that the 25 years should be broken down into five-year chunks with milestones to go with it. So we're very proud of having come up with the idea and also the pioneers. But now we have to see that that's taken forward and translated into action. And the fear, which many environmentalists have, is that this is the high water mark and it's downhill from now on. And the challenge is to take the opportunity and the enormous substantial progress that the 25-year plan itself represents and cement it into the core of economic policy for now and forever. And that's why we advocated legislation in our advice to the Secretary of State. And I must stress too 
this is not some uh, you know commitment which uh, just floats. Natural capital is going backwards. We are not even stopping the rot at the current level. And one of the things we have done at the Natural Capital Committee, which I'm again proud of, is we've engaged with the Office of Natural, uh, National Statistics to start to develop the natural capital balance sheets and to measure the state of natural capital at the economy level. And it shows it's declining. And this is very important. This is about shining a torch. This is not about just arguing for the environment. This is using hard measurements to show whether, in fact, progress is being made. So this is why it's really important not just to argue for the environment, but to show why it's economically important and to measure its economic performance so anyone who commits to improving the natural environment could be held to account as to whether they're actually doing it. Now, we want to incorporate the environment into the economy because we care about the environment. But we have a narrower and more uh, utilitarian reason for doing this. It's not the main reason for caring about the environment, but it sure helps. And that's that it's extremely economically inefficient to be brown and not green. An efficient market, 101 economics, tells you that the costs of any activity must be fully taken into account in the market. And that means what's called externalities must be taken into account, and that means the cost of pollution must be part of the calculation. It is not an efficient market to allow carbon to leach out of the soils and then pretend that that's your costs and that's the prices and that's the outputs. The price of carbon has to be incorporated. The price of fertiliser in its uh, externality effects has to be incorporated. The price of pesticides, the price of nitrates, all these things. If you leave them out of a market, they will have a value of zero and then we will do economic damage to our economy and whether or not GDP measures this properly, we will not be maximising the genuine economic prosperity and the genuine economic growth we can have. And an efficient market incorporates public goods which a private market will not create of its own. That's why the public money for public goods is so important. But you have to be extremely clear as to what you think a public good is. And here's a real risk. So public money for public goods. We all know that there are many demands on public expenditure. And if you can stretch the definition to fill the basket of what was the money from the common agricultural policy, you can incorporate all sorts of stuff in here. Rural broadband docking pig's tails, all sorts of other things can be put into the basket of the amount of money that's available to provide these public goods. And I'm not saying any of those things aren't desirable things to do, but we have to be very careful that the very good principle doesn't end up being diluted because public goods mean anything that anyone thinks is a good idea to be done and anything that fits a, political polit uh, a particular political narrative at a point in time. So there's a real task there to be utterly clear which public goods matter. And here's another point. People resist economics in this area because they think that somehow economists are going around and saying the view of Helvenin is worth 562,462 pence, etc., etc. This isn't what's going on. Economics is about the allocation of scarce resources. It's about how much money and how much resources you spend amongst the competing ends of different environmental things that you want to do. And if you decide to spend more money protecting one thing, you are implicitly deciding to spend less money protecting something else. And if you don't engage with those costs and the difference of those costs and the justifications of those different costs, you'll end up with an outcome where things that really matter, things like beauty of landscapes gets valued at zero and other things which are easy to value get taken into account. And that's been the story of our environment, that things that are really precious to us uh, resist any notion that they should be brought into the calculation of costs and the result is they get trashed. So beauty, health, recreation, biodiversity, these are all part of an efficient market, an efficient economy, and efficient economic prosperity. So do we have any examples of where we're being economically inefficient? 
And now, having been shot ahead with the slides, I can't get to the next slide. Here we are. Good. Um, well, if you want to improve the natural environment, and you look at the current situation, it's pretty hard to make it worse in one dimension, which is agriculture. And um, for, the, for the record, you, know, you have to kind of declare this now. I'm a Remainer. I'm half East German, and, and that matters to me greatly. But the one thing that um, no, <laughs> the one thing I think is great about Brexit is getting out of the common agricultural policy. This is extremely economically illiterate as a policy, and we spend much more on the common agricultural policy and its environmental, largely detrimental impacts than we spend on the rest of the environment. It's incredible. It's seventy percent of our land. And when you think about, it's not just our land, what about the state of our rivers? What about the state of our estuaries? What about the ammonia in the air that's part of air pollution? This is a really big ticket item. And if you think that economics isn't relevant to these kinds of areas, then all I can say is either economists have, it's probably true, badly projected what they're trying to do, or you've got some other solution to agriculture that no one yet has found. The common agricultural policy is extremely bad for the environment, as the agricultural consultation paper says. I don't need to educate anyone in this room about the devastation to farmland birds, to all sorts of measures that come from the way we carry out agriculture. But it's not just bad for the environment. It's bad for the consumers. It's bad economics. You pay the tariffs. You pay for higher water bills to clean up the stuff that comes off the land because it's incentivised by the schemes we have. You pay a whole host of things as consumers as a consequence of a bad agricultural framework. It's terribly bad for taxpayers. People think, that, oh, just because the Europeans fund this, we fund the EU, which funds this, which has been the most important significant part of total EU spending since 1950, whatever it was, and the Treaty of Rome. This absorbs more than anything else in Europe. Okay? And at times it's been 70, 80 percent of the total budget. You pay three billion pounds, mainly to people to own land. You exempt them from a whole series of normal taxation regimes like rates, inheritance tax, fuel duty, etc. You exempt them from the charges for the pollution which any industrial company would pay. And then you think at the end of that, you get nine billion of output. So when you add on all the other bits to the three billion, the net value of British agriculture is a feeble three, four, maybe five billion in total. It's 0.7% of GDP. Agriculture could do much better than this. And it's terribly bad for farmers. Why? Because the subsidies are capitalised in the land prices. And you try and work out how you make money paying £10,000 an acre for prime land or even £5,000 an acre for hill farm land in Exmoor. You can't. No wonder farmers are in the position they are. But the reason the land price is inflated is because they're paid for owning the land and the returns go straight into that frame. Let me move on to my last slide and just keeping within my time frame. So what is to be done? Well, we should whatever perspective on Brexit or anything else we take, I think for all those people who care about our natural environment should say with this green paper, uh, not green paper, this paper, the 25 year plan, provides an extraordinary opportunity to take things forward. And having slogged away at seven years, chairing the Natural Capital Committee, coming up with this idea, there is a moment to pause and say, this is a great moment, a great opportunity. But the question is, is it going to work? Are we going in five or ten years' time to say it was all lots of nice noise, but the reality is that we just followed the old path after people had got over the excitement of the commitment to these things? Now, the way to do this is what really matters. And the first point is to understand what that overarching objective to leave the natural environment in a better state for the future generations really means. Now here, there's a tension. And there's a tension in my committee too. One view about this is what it means is the outputs must be better. The water must be cleaner, the air must be better, 
those things that are direct outputs we can measure and compare them with the outputs of baked beans or chocolates or whatever else it is we want to uh, think, although you can't get a water supply to run continuously through a chocolate factory anymore, uh, as we discovered in the weather um, uh, a week or so ago. Now that view just says, pick a load of outputs, measure, the, measure the, how they're doing and put some ticks in the boxes. And it's not going to be hard to put a tick in the air quality box in 25 years' time. It'd be horrific if you couldn't. Okay? It's not actually going to be that hard to put a tick in the water quality box either. But is that leaving the natural environment in a better state for future generations? And I personally would say it's necessary, but not sufficient. The question I'm really interested in is, what is the state of the assets that the next generation inherits? And that's what natural capital is about, it's capital assets. In the same way you might ask, how good is the housing in 25 years' time, and look at the rents people pay and how much the houses cost. But actually another question is, how many houses are there, what state are there, are they insulated, what's the nature of those things? So I think it's about assets and also outputs. And the asset requirement requires accounting, it requires capital maintenance, it requires assets in perpetuity. This may bore people, but it's absolutely crucial that you do the accounting of this properly. And we really do keep to that level. And that's why the ONS work is so important. Now, there are embedded in this plan, and it's also embedded, the, some of these things, in the agriculture consultation, some really radical concepts or principles, which if they were part of government policy, are very likely to contribute massively to actually improving the assets. The net environmental gain requirement for developments, if we really meant it, if the planning system really implemented that, that means that natural capital would by definition not go down. There would be no damage which was not fully compensated for and more. Now, the difference between the idea and the reality is enormous. But that principle is at the absolute essence of natural capital and what I call the aggregate natural capital review, uh, rule, which I set out in my book. You have to pay compensation. And it's not re reasonable to assume there will not be damage. There will be damage. And environmentalists have to face up to that. And some of that damage, I would argue, will be justified. But only in the context that the full compensation for that damage is made up. And you have to think, who's going to do this? Who's going to work out what is compensation? What kind of rules are going to be used? That's a big live action. The second point which someone made earlier, I think from a question from the Friends of the Earth about, net, about a polluter pays principle. It's even in the agricultural consultation document. Just imagine what British agriculture would look like tomorrow morning if all the pollution externalities were integrated and internalised in the price. It would be a revolution. Imagine if pesticide pollution was taxed, fertiliser pollution was taxed, herbicide pollution was taxed, all those other um, drugs and other things that go through to the natural environment, through to everything from uh, the uh, uh, soils to the beetles to all that kind of stuff. All those externalities were included. That really would be radical. And it is in the agricultural paper. And again, who is the polluter? Who is going to pay? How much are they going to pay? Absolutely central. Now, I want to throw a final idea, which is my own. Um, and I think this is uh, worth thinking about. In broadband, in electricity, in water, and in some as aspects of transport, it is taken for granted that a decent society ensures that all citizens have access to these services. And the broadband debate is now part of that. It ought to be a universal service obligation. Let me leave you with the thought that we ought to have a USO for citizens' rights to access to the environment and the countryside. And we ought to fill out what that means in the same way we're trying to fill out what speed of broadband people ought to have. Imagine if every child had the right to access to green spaces. Imagine if the countryside, the green belt, etc., was opened up so people can properly engage back in nature. And I think 
That is a generalization of a rule which was one of the founding ideas behind the Open Space Society and fed into the National Trust. But I also think it bears in that crucial chapter in the 25-year plan, which is about re-engaging children with nature. We ought to make sure that's a right for children. Thank you very much.